One of the highlights of mine and Kelly's life as a married couple has been parents. And uh, our first child was born, and most of you know her, Reagan. And we were pretty excited as Reagan was born and went through the whole, you know, go to the hospital to do all those crazy things, come home, try to get used to there's a third human alive in our house. And then about the time you get used to it, then we both have to go back to work. Maternity leave was over for Kelly. And so at that time, we lived close to my parents. And so my mom was actually watching Reagan as we went back to work. And each day, most days of the week, we would try to go to lunch at my mom and dad's to give my mom a break and so we could hang out with Reagan because this was our first child and this was a, a big deal to us. And there was one day that we actually went over there for lunch. I was holding Reagan. She was about 20 months old at this time. And I was playing with her and she was talking to me and we were having a good time. And then there's this stare that came over her face. It became a blank stare, and she actually froze right in front of me, and I could not get her to talk to me. I could not get her to move. She had a hold of my jacket or shirt, whatever I had on, and had a death grip, and she was frozen. And actually, later on that day or the next day, I had to ask Kelly what happened next because I switched into go mode. I got up. I was out the door getting in my truck because all I knew to do in that moment was I'm out of control. I don't know what to do with this person, so I'm going to get her to somebody that does. So I'm headed to the hospital. Kelly jumps in the truck with me, and we head in the direction of the hospital that was a little about two miles away. And in this moment... There was a lot of fear going on because, you see, Reagan wasn't the first child that my wife was pregnant with. She was the first child born to us. A few years prior to Reagan's birth, our first pregnancy had ended in miscarriage. And at that time, I would, if I'm being honest and, and vulnerable, it wasn't the promises of God or, or the scripture that I was relying on. It was the lies of the enemy simply telling us that this was your one shot to be parents. It'll never happen again. If you get pregnant again, then your wife will have another miscarriage. And we thought we were past all of that emotions when Reagan was born because God had answered our prayer. Here we go. We have our child. I mean, it was monumental when she started talking and she said, Dad, Dad, first. Just saying, Kelly can attest to that. Dad, dad. Maybe because I worked with her over and over. Dad, dad, dad. And it was monumental when she rolled over for the first time or when she walked for the first time. We actually, uh, you know, because of social media nowadays, we, it popped up on our, our, on our memories that it was a little over 10 and a half, 11 years ago when she started walking. It was on a Wednesday night. It was in our kitchen. And, and you watch the video and you hear this weird voice going, come on, you can do it. You can do it. It was me. And I'm like, I didn't sound like that. And you're like, yes, you did, Jonathan. How many knows that sometimes as parents, we do dumb things when our parents do great things because we're like, yes, you can do this. We were there for all of those times. But in this moment, all of those past memories of the great things that we had experienced were not on the forefront of our mind. The dreams that we had for her of going to kindergarten and getting a high school and a, maybe a college education or learning how to drive, learning how to ride a bicycle, none of those things had yet to happen. This was a true in-between moment in our lives, a moment where the past had been so great and the future was so bright, but in this moment, all of that was up in the air. It was an in-between moment in our lives. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there now. A moment in your life where the past great memories are so great, but they're clouded by your present tragedy, and the future seems so far away. You know, today as we dive back into this John series, the Believe series, and we look to Scripture, as we lean into John chapter number 19, I believe this is exactly where we're at in Scripture, an in-between moment. We spoke about the cross and the crucifixion. Now Jesus has died. 
The awe and the majesty that surrounded his birth has since waned to a distant memory in those of the disciples' eyes. The walking on the water and saving Peter, the feeding, the feeding of the 5,000, and even the promise of the future seemed lost in this moment for the disciples. You see, in John chapter number 19, in this passage, it is the culmination of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's been crucified. His body needs to be taken down from the cross and properly prepared for burial before the Sabbath begins. And the religious leaders who had orchestrated his crucifixion are still in power in the atmosphere is filled with fear among Jesus' followers. That's the background. That's the context of the scripture that we're going to read today. So if you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me or you can look on the screens beside me. We're going to be looking to John chapter 19. We're going to start reading and walking through several verses of scripture, starting with this verse, verse number 38. John 19, verse 38. Read along with me today. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. You see, in Jewish times or in this time of Scripture, in this time in our culture, burial was a big process. It was a process that people took a lot of pride in, took a lot of time in. And we introduced to this man named Joseph of Arimathea, who is a believer, but Scripture tells us that he was a secret believer. While he was a secret believer, he's mentioned in all of the four Gospels, in John that we just read. He's also mentioned in Matthew and Mark and Luke. But he's only mentioned at the burial, at this moment in history. You know, a lot of commentators, a lot of pastors, maybe you even have heard sermons before that sometimes when we view Scripture, we take some pot shots at those that were living in that time. And we ask questions, why didn't they do this or why did they just show up? And a lot of times I would say Joseph is one of those guys. We're like, he was a disciple. Well, we've never heard of him. Where was he at? Was he afraid of testifying? Was he a timid person? Was he weak? Or was he almost just an inconsequential believer? Was he denying the Lord almost? Why was he so afraid? Instead of sometimes stepping back and giving them a little grace because this was not their past, this was their present that they were living out. Just to give a little bit of context. They were under Roman siege that the Romans controlled, they were in power. And do you know that if you believed, and, and especially if you taught something other than what the Romans wanted you to, it could cost you your life. So to be a follower of Jesus was an intimate decision, immediate decision of, is my life worth it or not? And sometimes we praise Peter in the same breath that, man, he jumped right in. I mean, it was an easy conversation that we read about in the Gospels. When Jesus invited him to be a disciple, he simply walked up and, and Peter is fishing. He's like, hey, bro, throw your nets down. Come be a follower of me. You don't have to fish for a fish anymore. I'll make you fishers of men. I mean, that's a pretty short conversation. Scripture doesn't tell us that Peter asked any questions. Peter dropped his nets and he went and followed him. But Scripture also shows us that Peter made a lot of mistakes. Some of us can relate to him. I know I can. Sometimes Peter would open up his mouth, but he would, his mouth would engage before his brain would and then insert foot, and then he would have to retract a lot of times. I'm going to be there for you, Jesus, and then he denies him three times. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for growth in Peter's life that we get to examine and we get to see, but Joseph, we're like, who is this guy? What are you saying? I'm simply saying this. While judgment should not be upon our lips for either one of these disciples, we should, we should at the same time give them grace and say, you know what, maybe Joseph was just as much a disciple as Peter was. It just took him longer to get there. Now, I understand proximity means a lot. And because 
of Peter's ultimate jumping in or his immediate jumping in to be a disciple. He got to be close to Jesus. His proximity to the Son of God was very close. And because Joseph decided to follow him from a distance, that proximity was a little bit farther away. But give him his due. In in Jesus' moment of need, Peter wasn't there. He was hiding with the other disciples in the other upper room. Joseph stepped up and says, I've got a place to bury him. Let's keep reading there, continuing reading in verse 38. So he came and took his body away, his body. Verse 39 says, Nicodemus also who had earlier come to Jesus by night came bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds in weight. We're introduced to somebody once again named Nicodemus, which we know if you've read, read scripture before, this is not the first time that we read about Nicodemus, but we also sometimes have an opinion about him because he came to Jesus at night. And you're like, why, why did he come to him at night? Everybody else says, we read so many times in scripture that there was crowds and crowds and crowds of people all around Jesus. Why didn't he join the crowd? Well, again, sometimes we have to realize their context. Nicodemus was a high-ranking religious leader. And in Jewish customs, in the way of becoming a rabbi, there was a lot of steps. And he had went through them all. He was looked to as a mighty religious leader, a spiritual authority in Israel at the time. Now you have this young preacher, this man that is claiming to be the son of God, that is teaching and doing things in a way that is so contradicting to everything that Nicodemus had ever heard. So what are you saying? I'm saying this. We should not marvel or judge that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. We should actually marvel that Nicodemus came to Jesus at all. That he gave Jesus the opportunity While everything that he knew said disagree, don't believe, he still went and gave Jesus the opportunity at night to answer all of his questions. And we don't know what happened, but in that moment, but through reading this scripture, something happened in that that conversation at night that led to Nicodemus becoming a disciple because Nicodemus was there with Joseph to prepare Jesus' body for burial. Verse 40 says, so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with spices, as in the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. As we read through these verses of Scripture, some people just read really fast because we want to get to the resurrection. And yes, we're going to get there in this series and we're going to celebrate because that's really why we're here. We don't serve a God that's still in a tomb. But let's get there. But in this moment, these verses of Scripture have some challenges for us have some instructions for us that we don't need to ignore or lean away from that we need to lean into. In verses 38 through 42 that we've just read, it challenges us, number one, to confront our fears. At some point in our lives, there's going to have to be a mark that we decide to cross the line and truly be a follower of Jesus. It not only challenges us to confront our fears, but in these verses of Scripture, it challenges us to worship God with extravagance. Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of spices. That was of royalty weight. He saw something in Jesus that wanted him to worship him with extravagance. Not only do these verses of Scripture challenge us to confront our fears and challenge us to worship God with extravagance, it challenges us to embrace the hope of new beginnings in Christ. To help us move from scarcity to boldness, just as Joseph and Nicodemus did when they took a stand for Jesus. So as you do Bible study, as you do your Devo time, don't just simply read through Scripture and say, well, let me get to the good part. Because God wants to speak to you in every part. Just a few weeks ago, I was awakened at 4.40 a.m. 
And if that's your normal time to get up, hmm, I respect whatever you're supposed to do. I don't know. I just I respect you. And you're like, bro, I'm a farmer. I get up at 2 o'clock. Even more respect because I had some corn the other night, fresh corn. It was a, I, mean, I didn't get back to my message. But a lot of respect for people that get up super early. Now, I'm not a person that, that gets up at noon, and if you wake up at noon, hey, no judgment. You keep doing your thing. But normally, my alarm goes off somewhere, normally close to 6 o'clock. Sometimes if I'm being extra, uh, woo, let's go, it's 5.30. But 6 a.m. is normally what time, and, and that day, that's the time that my alarm was set for. And so for all of you type A people, that's an hour and 20 minutes before my alarm goes off, supposed to go off, then I'm awakened. So I wake up and I can't go back to sleep. You know, sometimes you rustle around, you go right back to sleep, but I couldn't go to, back to sleep. And so I was like, okay, I'll go ahead and get up. And my morning routine is to get up and just go ahead and get ready. And then once I get ready, I go in there and I make that, that first cup of coffee. Come on, somebody. You know, the, the morning is waking up. The old Folgers commercial. If you still drink Folgers, no judgment with that either. But anyways, there's greater things out there. And so <clears throat> I make my first cup of coffee. And I have my Jesus time. Because I know that I need Jesus time every day. That sounds so spiritual. No, it actually sounds so realistic. Because if you really knew me, you'd be like, yes, you need Jesus time every day. So most days that happens. So that's what happened. I drink my coffee. I'm doing my devotional. I'm praying. And then I got done with my devotional time. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, hey, Jonathan, I want you to pull up the preaching calendar. I want you to look what you're preaching on in a few weeks. And, it, and if you know me, I love to prepare. I think that there's awesome things that happen when they're spontaneous. But I think really cool things happen too when you plan them. So I like to plan. And so it wouldn't be weird for me to look a few weeks out and just see the scripture and say, okay, that's what I'm preaching on. But I looked at the scriptures and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, hey, go and open the Bible and I want you to read those verses. And it was these verses that we just read. So I read through them and I, and I read about Joseph and I was reminded of Nicodemus was there also. And I read through it and I was like, oh, Holy Spirit, that's good. I'm ready to go about my day. And he's like, no, stop. Step back just for a minute. I'm like, I'm sitting on the couch. How am I supposed to step? No, Jonathan, in your mind, step back from the scripture. And so I was like, okay, what do I see here? And then it hit me that these verses of scripture, verses 38 through 42, was a prime example of an in-between moment in the disciples' life and Jesus' life. Because they didn't have John 20. They didn't have the rest of the story. That, their present reality was their reality. So what are you saying? I am saying this, that Jesus was dead in the tomb. And the disciples are hiding in fear. And while the past had been glorious, it was fading in the hearts fast of those who followed Jesus the closest. And the future that he had promised seemed out of reach and out of touch and doomed never to become a reality. And in that moment, I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Jonathan, in the moment that you're going to deliver the word at Christ's place, Old Cheney, there's going to be people there hmm, that are in the house or joining online that are living in their in-between moments. And I want to be very cautious to give the Holy Spirit credit or to blame the Holy Spirit because sometimes we say things and it could be bad pizza. But I really believe there's people here or joining us online, that you're living right in an in-between moment. So I believe God gave me some promises and gave me some truths, some takeaways that I want you to lean into because I believe if you'll lean into these, you can make it through your in-between moment. So number one, we realize there's in-between moments in life, so how do we make it through? In the in-between, we must realize there is still hope, number one. Jesus had spent three and a half years preparing the disciples for this moment. And they missed most of what Jesus was trying to teach them. They didn't have hope. Their hope was lost. Their hope was dead in a tomb. 
And you might be here today and the darkness of your present is overshadowing the hope that you had in the past and making the future hopeless in your eyes. But I'm here today to remind you that there is hope in the in-between moments because Jesus did walk out of the grave and Jesus is here today to give you that hope. And there's no tragedy, there's not a situation, there's not a circumstance that you can escape the hope that Jesus has for you. The psalmist put it this way in Psalms 139, verses 7 through 10. It says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, guess what? You are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. Verse 9, if I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Can we be reminded in this moment, whatever tragedy you're facing, that God is there. It doesn't matter if you make your bed in the heavens or in the depths of the earth. It doesn't matter if you're in the farthest oceans or the winds of the sea. Jesus is here to tell you today that I've never left you. I've never forsake you. I still know you by name, and I'm still here to give you hope. Even in the in-between moments of life, we can have hope because the hope giver is right there. Hope is not a substance. Hope is a person. And you can lose substances and substances come in and out of your life, but Jesus is always present. There's in-between moments in life that will happen. And number one, we can still have hope in the in-between. Number two, in the in-between, there is still peace. There's so many references in the gospel and scripture that we can see that Jesus is peace, that Jesus is the peace giver. One of my favorite stories is when Jesus comes up to the disciples And the paraphrase Jonathan version, because I don't have it all memorized, but if you're an Everman or Warrior, there's four verses this week that you better be memorizing. But that's for another time and another place. But to paraphrase the story, Jesus comes up to the disciples and he's like, hey guys, I want to go to the other side of the sea. I want you to join me, but why don't you jump in the boat, you row over there, and I'll meet you there. Have you ever thought how Jesus was going to meet them there and what the thoughts of the disciples? They're looking around saying there's one boat. How's Jesus going to get over there? But even in their questions, they got in the boat and followed his instructions. Man, that's a word for somebody. Sometimes you don't need everything to know what Jesus is asking you to do. Just take what he's given you and do it. So they got in the boat, and they started rowing. And it's a long distance. So it got dark, and then it got stormy, and then they got scared. No judgment there, because I don't like to be in the dark by myself. Especially in the deer woods by myself. I don't even like to be in a church by myself when it's dark. You're like, my mama used to tell me, son, there's sin in your life if you're afraid of the church. I'm like, get that sin out of my life. I'm, it's dark. I mean, so I get it. But where was Jesus in their moment of fear? Where was Jesus when they were facing the storm? He was walking toward them on the water. He was coming to them. He wasn't over there waiting. I'm saying, hey, it's about time for the boys to show up. He already knew that they were facing fear. He already knew that they were facing tragedy. So he said, I might as well just walk out there and meet them. And in verse 50 of Mark 6, it says this, for they all saw him. Another gospel says, it's a ghost. What's going on? I mean, this is went from bad to worse. Now they're seeing ghosts. And Jesus, and they were terrified, scripture says. But immediately... Immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Why are you telling us this today, Jonathan? Because I want you to know that whatever you're facing today, if I say it once, I'll say it twice. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing today, I want you to know that yes, you are terrified, yes, you are fearful, but Jesus has not excluded you. He's not waiting to meet you on the other side of the sea. He is walking in the direction that you are at and he's gonna be there to say, take heart, don't be afraid, Immediately, Jesus will show up on the scene. In the in-between moments in life, there is still hope. In the in-between moments in life, there is still peace. And number three, in the in-between moments of life, there is still a promise to be fulfilled. Because you see, 
the disciples, some of them were illiterate to the things of the law, and some of them were educated. So they knew that Jesus, there was things about Jesus, and there was things that were yet to come to pass. But in this moment, their faith had waned. Their faith had drained. And all of those promises they had read about in the Old Testament, they're like, well, it's, it's lost. It's gone. Even in our unbelief does not cause Jesus to stop moving the promise forward. Even while they were hiding, even while they were in fear, Jesus was still moving the stone away three days later and walking out of the grave. Because he knew that he had made some promises that were yet to be fulfilled. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the birth of the church in Acts 2. It hadn't happened yet. That was a promise yet to be fulfilled. The Holy Spirit being poured out on the new church to empower them to become evangelists all around the world had yet to happen. Jesus knew that. That was a promise that he was yet to be fulfilled. There was a guy named Saul that was out to kill every Christian, but he would have a Damascus Road experience in which he would meet Jesus face to face and because of that face-to-face -face experience, Jesus would change his name from Saul to Paul and then he would go on to write over a third of half of the New Testament. There were still promises to be fulfilled and Jesus knew that. The church had yet to be birthed. There was still a crazy group of teenagers to be born and grow up and form a, with a young adults and say, you know what, let's do church a little bit different. Let's start at 12 o'clock. Let's start with a lunch. And then almost 50 years later, we're sitting and standing in an auditorium and a church is called Christ Place. Jesus knew that even when he was in the tomb that there was a promise of a church yet to be fulfilled. In the in-between moments in life when we don't feel like we're on the mountaintop, Jesus is saying the promise is still coming. Just to go a little bit old school for a minute, there was an old Karen Wheaton song that there's a promise coming down a dusty road. There's still a promise coming down your dusty road today that I don't care what the devil has told you. I don't care how many people that said it's not going to happen. If Jesus promised you, you can take it to the bank because it's going to happen. There's not a promise that Jesus has ever made that he's not fulfilled. There's not something he's ever said that he's had to take back. There's not something he's ever said that happened that did not happen. We can praise him even in the in-between moments of our life. Don't wait till the victory comes before you start praising him. Start praising him and bring the victory to yourself. The psalmist tells us, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat at my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Though a host, other versions say, though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. God wants to fulfill promises in your life that everybody around you has told you it cannot happen. And you've even had the thought today I don't see how it's going to happen. Well, guess what? You don't have to see it because the things that are unseen are always more powerful than the things that these eyes can see. Scripture tells me that God's ways, Jonathan, they're always going to be higher than yours. His thoughts are always going to be greater than mine. And in the in-between moments in your life, there's still hope. There's still peace. And there's still a promise yet to be fulfilled. That day when Reagan was 20 months old and she was laying in my arms lifeless as we walked into the hospital. They took us back, walked into an emergency room, room and I laid my daughter's lifeless body on the bed. <laughs> and you know, I would like to say as a pastor, I was faith-filled I was praying, I was believing that my daughter was going to walk out of that hospital unscathed, that this was just a miracle in the, in the waiting to happen. But if I'm being honest with you, none of those thoughts were in my mind. The thoughts that were going through my mind is like the devil's telling, well, I got one through miscarriage, now I'm going to get this one through this. The thoughts that were going in my mind as I walked in here with a daughter, I'm going to walk out without a daughter. And in that in-between moment, the doctor came in and he said, Jonathan and Kelly, I want you to look at me. 
my doctor, my name is so-and-so, and this is my first day working in this emergency room. Because the last 14 years, I have worked at Children's Hospital, specializing in febrile seizures, and I have personally seen and worked 900, I'll never forget this, 989 cases. And your daughter is having a febrile seizure and she's going to walk out of here today. She's going to be okay. What are you saying? I'm saying that in the in-between moments, God had let a person be born. They became a doctor. They was trained for 14 years. And in the moment that I needed God to came through, he had a doctor just happen to start at an emergency room and just happen to be on the shift when I came in with a daughter having a surgery or seizure. What are you saying? I'm saying God will show up when we least expect it, even if we don't have the faith. And in that moment, we were standing there. Reagan had still not awakened. So Kelly came around to the other side of the bed. And one of Reagan's favorite songs was the old hymn, Oh How I Love Jesus. So Kelly leaned down and started singing it into her ear. I've never heard an angelic voice before. But I'm telling you, an angelic voice started coming out of that 20-month-old child named Reagan, and she started singing back to her mama. Oh, how I love Jesus. Sing it with us today. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I'm telling you, church. That God will come through in your in-between moments. Reagan is no longer that 20-month-old child laying in a hospital room, but now she's in the eighth grade serving in our CP Kids ministry as a junior team member, leading a second grade small group. Take that, devil. What the devil meant to destroy you, God will use to make you go to the next level. And at the same moment, I understand that my in-between moment may be different than yours. Maybe your in-between moment doesn't have a happy ending like mine does. Maybe you lost a child. Maybe your story is more like Pastor Rick's that he shared a few weeks ago in which his dad fell on the ice and hit his head. And after Pastor Rick trying to get him to go to the hospital, his dad said no. And then a few days later, he died of a brain bleed. That in between looks different. Maybe you're here today or you're joining us online and your in between moments are like, you know, my marriage did not survive the in between moment. Maybe you're here today and say, you know what? My job is gone. It didn't survive. I want you to know that while your story may not look like mine, your story, you can still have hope, you can still have peace, and you still have a promise in your in-between that God wants to fulfill. It might not be fulfilled in these eyes, in these eyes, in these times, or even this side of heaven. But I'm telling you, if Jesus made a promise to you, if it takes all the way that we walk into glory, to never be separated from the presence of Jesus ever again, I'm telling you that Jesus will still fulfill the promise in your life. I want to pray for those here in the house. Maybe you're going through an in-between moment. Maybe you know somebody. Maybe it's your mom, it's your dad, it's your friend. I want to pray before, for you before we transition into anything else. Let's pray together. Father.
in the name of Jesus. God, I just pray for those that are here. God, I don't know what their circumstances are. I don't know what their in-between details are in their life. God, where they're at, or maybe it's a family member that they see or in an in-between moment or a friend. God, but you do. And God, I'm asking them to be reminded of your peace. I'm asking them to be reminded of your hope. I'm asking them to be reminded that there's promises that you've made that are yet to be fulfilled in their lives. That God, if we're in an in-between moment, we won't rush out of here when we end the service, but we'll come up and we'll get that prayer. We'll lean in. We'll take that moment to be reminded. God, meet them right there in their in-between moment. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below and turn on notifications for our YouTube channel. That way you'll be notified when we post more life-giving messages and go live for our weekend services. Thanks for watching.